The ruin of Castle Urquhart in the highlands of northern Scotland dominates the shore of a lake shrouded by mystery. The murky waters have hidden a persistent and puzzling tale for 1,400 years. The lake is called Loch Ness. It is said that here lives a monster that can make the surface of a lake boil with foam. What is beneath the surface of the loch? We will be closer to knowing the answer. Closer for having discovered new evidence in search of the Loch Ness Monster. The In Search Of cameras record a long trail of bubbles, evidence of something huge passing beneath our lens. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Few of the great mysteries we will explore in this series are as compelling as the accounts of an unknown beast which lives in a picturesque Scottish lake. A compelling mystery because in spite of the many sightings over hundreds of years, there was little evidence until recently to support the possibility of the creature being real. Tonight, we'll take a hard look at the new evidence. Loch Ness is remarkable in many ways. The lake was created by a great movement of the Earth's crust. It is open to the sea at both ends, through a series of lesser lakes, rivers, and in more recent times, large canals. Loch Ness is wedged between mountains, only a mile wide, but 24 miles long. Its depth may exceed 900 feet in some places, but no one to this day knows for sure how deep the lake is. People have made their lives by the lake for thousands of years. Others have come for just one reason, to glimpse a monster. Some are more serious about getting a look at the creature than others. Scientists by the expedition full roam the lake. From MIT and the Academy of Applied Science they come. The National Geographic Society scours for underwater camera positions. Scientific associations in England are hard at work too. An old abbey by the shore of the lake is where the quest has its origins. St. Columba came to Loch Ness in the 6th century to convert barbarians. He founded a Benedictine order that maintains the abbey today. And as Father Gregory recalls, St. Columba also founded a legend. St. Columba came up this way according to St. Adamnan, who wrote his life in the next century, that's about the 4th century. Um, he came up from Iona with a few of his monks and they came up the chain of locks, Loch Oish, Loch Lochy, on his way to convert the king of the Picts, the northern Picts, King Brood. Adamnan recounts that at the end of Loch Ness, where the Ness flows into the sea, they just come up to the end, they were going to cross the Ness, and a man was swimming across the river and this great serpent thing, a beast, appeared 
and St. Damon says the holy man, <clears throat> the great sign of the cross in a loud voice, drove it off so they didn't uh, do any harm to him. Well, we don't know how much truth that is in that, but that's the first, uh, first uh, account we have uh, of, this, of this strange thing that's in the loch. Perhaps a modern camera caught a descendant of the great serpent described by St. Columba in the 6th century. Early in the morning of April 1st, 1934, a London surgeon of impeccable reputation snapped this picture. A lumberjack working near the lake took this picture in 1951. An American scientist produced a view of the creature with an underwater camera. The murkiness of Loch Ness obscures the shot, but even some of the most skeptical investigators consider the picture positive evidence that a large animal exists in the lake. Motion picture film was made in 1966 by another Loch Ness investigator. The film was examined by Royal Air Force photo intelligence experts and certified to be genuine. 1,400 years of recorded sightings that began with the experience of a Christian missionary in the 6th century. Father Gregory's own experience was not unlike that reported by the saint who founded his order. We had an organist friend out from London, and um, we were standing on the edge of the lock on the stone jetty, looking across the bay on the right, and we were suddenly surprised. There were no boats, first of all, there were no boats visible at all suddenly noticed a tremendous commotion in the bay and we couldn't see what was causing this at first and then we were fairly staggered to see a little further on a huge neck emerge we would both agreed about seven feet at least above the water at a slight angle moving along slowly for about 17 seconds we estimated and then it went down we didn't see any of the body but this huge this height out of the water was was extraordinary in fact, this organist said to me, he said, if I hadn't been there, he'd have felt like running. It gave him such a queer feeling. Mm. Sergeant Henderson is one of the senior constables patrolling the little communities around Loch Ness. One patrol put him squarely at the heart of the mystery of the lake. Uh, about halfway between Fort Augustus and here, we um, saw something in the water. We thought it was a boat in difficulties. We rushed down. When we got there to the water, we saw these two fins about 20 feet apart, about four feet out of the water, I would say, traveling towards Invermorris and stayed up for five or six seconds, uh, submerged, came back up again, and stayed up for another 10 seconds, then submerged finally, didn't come back up again. Now, the water was quite calm at the time, but when things submerged, and finally there was a terrific wash came onto the shore. Alex Campbell was a waterman on Loch Ness most of his working life. Well, during my working life, we, we were responsible for the preservation of the salmon stocks in these areas. Glen Morrison, Glen Gary, Loch Ness, and all the other adjacent adjoining rivers. That was the main job. Then there was the hatchery work. I was expecting a run of fresh salmon because as soon as they reach their home river, they jump and cavort about as though they were glad to be home. I was looking across, and then just off the Abbey Boathouse, which is across there, and about 250 yards from where I was standing, suddenly there was a most terrific upsurge of water. Then the long, tapering neck small head which was turning very cruel i should say scared looking and a huge humped body which i estimated at 30 feet long i just and i shut my eyes three times to make quite sure that i wasn't seeing something that i you know it didn't exist however then i heard the noise of the engine of two fishing trawlers that had just, just come, come out, out from, from the, the canal, canal block and were heading for Loch Ness. I said to myself, oh, this is going to be interesting. And meanwhile, this 
the head was even more excited, you see, the animal. I said to myself, this is going to be very exciting because as soon as the mouth, the first trawler, comes within my line of vision, it'll also come within the animal's line of vision. Well, that duly happened. And as soon as the bow of the first trawler appeared, oh, a terrific pl plunge into the depths. Upsurge was fantastic. Could this be Alex Campbell's monster? Some theorize that such creatures could have been trapped in Loch Ness during its primordial past, living relics of a lost world. The notion that creatures from the dawn of life on this planet still live among us is irresistible to many. It is proof they seek. For Ted Holliday, proof would be film of the monster, close up and in sharp focus. I'd been up that particular morning for about five o'clock watching the lock. When Mrs. Pickett finally came out to wash breakfast dishes about nine o'clock, I strolled over to have a word with her. Um, I left my camera behind me and I walked about 50 yards to chat with her. I turned and uh, looked across the lock. Well, actually, I looked over Mrs. Pickett's shoulder to a point about a quarter of a mile to the left of the Clanton Hotel across that side. And I saw this huge black mass it undulated into three humps proceeding from right to left. It was going at a fair speed, and the water was swelling up from the front of it in a big white wash. And I said to Mrs. Pickett, can you see that? She said she could. I said, well, watch it while I get the camera. And I rushed and grabbed the camera, and immediately a voice shouted after me, oh, it's gone down. Well, I put a binoculars on the spot, and there was a huge whirlpool, as though something had submerged into the lock, a huge patch about 50 yards across. Hundreds of cameras would be trained on the lock this summer. The in-search of camera would be among them and would capture a most remarkable event. The summer of 1976 was to be the beginning of the big push to find conclusive evidence that huge creatures live in Loch Ness. Three major expeditions would prowl the lake. Some men, like Robert Rhines of the Academy of Applied Sciences, were veterans of the chase. A veteran who could recall being hooked by a tantalizing glimpse of something big and unexplained, moving serenely just out of his reach. Well, uh, the first and only time uh, was in, uh, I believe, 1972, in June, near the summer solstice. Uh, we were with uh, Wing Commander Carey and his wife, my wife, it was, I think we were having coffee at their house, nothing stronger. And indeed, uh, Basil Carey said, I, I say that, that, that doesn't look like an upturned boat. Out we rushed uh, to the, the embankment uh, near their house, and we looked down in the middle of Urquhart Bay. And there, though it was, oh, 10, 10.30 in the evening, it was still quite light. There was a slight rain, but we unmistakably saw a, a giant hump in the water, move slowly out in the bay, turn around and come back, and then submerge. Uh, we had some telescopes, and we took turns, uh, not talking to each other, but looking through the telescopes and, and deliberately taking measurements with a 53-foot fishing vessel that was there. After all this was over, I went into the carrier's kitchen and taped what I had seen, the dimensions I thought I had seen, and then I individually taped them, and we were in unanimous view that uh, we had seen some 22 feet of back of something that intellectually to each of us that couldn't be anything other than a big animal, and about four to six feet out of the water at the apex. How long will you keep searching? Well, we're certainly going to stay here until we do find out one way or another uh, by uh, photographic and sonar evidence uh, what these things may be. Maybe this year, maybe next year, goodness knows how long, but uh, we're going to stick it out. Adrian Shine is another veteran of the hunt, but he has chosen to track his quarry at Loch Morar, just above Loch Ness. Monsters have been seen here, too, and the relative clarity of the water in Morar may give shine an advantage. We are laying out this year cameras, television cameras, beneath the surface in order to carry out a constant surveillance over some three months. We can lay the cameras down to 60 feet beneath the water and hope to get a silhouette of the creature passing over the top. We can get ranges underwater of nearly 100 feet. 
We have uh, some conventional cameras as well, conventional 35 millimeter cameras, but the video technique, in my opinion, is better because we have an immediate, an immediate uh, record. We don't have to process film, and of course we get a moving record as well. This tape uh, was taken with the camera at 60 feet below the surface, and there is a diver at 20 feet from the camera. Uh, this is followed by a further tape of the, uh, with the same setup and the diver at 40 feet from the camera and going up to the surface. You can see that, therefore, that we have at the surface at least 60 to 70 feet across the surface under surveillance. The National Geographic Society has decided to focus its efforts on Loch Ness. By carefully charting the lake bottom with sonar and positioning cameras at strategic points beneath the surface, the geographic scientists hope to overcome the handicap of poor visibility. The task is to guess where the monster is most likely to be, then lure it to the camera. The geographic team knows that Loch Ness was formed by an upheaval of the Earth's crust and that the trench created by that upheaval was enlarged by glaciers. The glaciers created a U-shaped bottom to the lake, but they did not completely obliterate the deep valleys which are characteristic of the region. So there are hidden depths to Loch Ness, depths capable of sheltering huge animals. National Geographic's Dr. Bob Ballard thinks these deep channels are his best bet. Because we're making the assumption that the monster would come into the bay using these deep channels. It would like to stay on the bottom and in de as deep a water as it can to get in near the river where there must be a lot of biological activity because of the river outflow. So we wanted to pick a spot where we could set up the camera close to a deep channel. Well, to do that, we had to survey it. So we've been went around the bay and put a series of reference points and then sitting on the castle, we shot in with a, with a compasses and positioned these reference points. And then we used those reference points to run back and forth across the bay with the ship, measuring the echo sounding. We figure that if we put our camera rig in about 120 feet of water, we're gonna be within 500 feet of one of these deep channels. You take the rope into your boat and you worry about keeping flat. National Geographic will position its cameras beneath the surface of the lake, suspended from sea anchors. The likelihood that the animals can be successfully photographed from the surface is being discounted. Emery Kristoff is the expedition's chief photographer. We discounted pretty much that it would be a mammal. And we would figure if it was a mammal and be air breathing, there would be more sightings of the creature. We feel then if we are dealing with a uh, amphibian or a reptile or something of the, of the fish nature, we have a creature that uh, hunts by, by listening, picks up vibrations in the water. So we, we've tailored our program really to this. The scientists are listening too with sensitive underwater microphones. Recordings have been made of the normal sounds of the lock at rest, at night or during the day, when boat traffic is at a minimum. They are tranquil sounds. Another recording was made late in the afternoon of July 5th. It was anything but tranquil. There was no way to tell for sure what the underwater microphones were picking up. But at about the same time the recording was made, and in about the same location, the In Search Of cameras recorded something even more remarkable. A long trail of bubbles breaking on the surface of the lock. There were no boats nearby. There were no divers. But something beneath the surface of the lock was creating a large disturbance. And it provides the most convincing photographic evidence gathered this year that the monster may in fact be real, that something big and alive 
was moving in front of our camera just beneath the surface of Loch Ness. Monster sightings have been reported in other lakes, in Ireland, Canada, the Scandinavian countries, and elsewhere. All of these sightings occurred in roughly the same northern latitude occupied by Loch Ness. Dr. Nicholas Hutton of the Smithsonian Institution is a preeminent paleontologist on intimate terms with our world's dim past. If there is something living in Loch Ness, what could it possibly be? Um, from my own point of view, I just don't think there is anything in Loch Ness. But there is an interesting theory put forth by Dr. Roy Mackel of the University of Chicago, who argues that uh, there may, in fact, be a population of giant eels. The point being that we know that Loch Ness supports a good population of salmon and eels. And eels, for example, live most of their lives in fresh water, but they go out to sea to reproduce. And then the young come back to the parent waters. Uh, certain individuals will fail to mature sexually and in consequence don't go to sea. They just live on in the fresh water and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and Mackel thinks that this might have happened, might be what's happening in Loch Ness, in which you have a few uh, resident uh, eels which have gotten uh, grown to enormous size. He suggests 20 feet, but he also uh, admits that uh, Size is extremely difficult to estimate, and uh, maybe 12 or 15 feet now might be more like it. If there is anything in Loch Ness that we don't know about uh, in ordinary scientific terms, it's got to be something like Mackel's eels. We now have volumes of data on the Loch Ness monsters, and none of the investigators involved disputes the probability that a creature lives in Loch Ness, and all of them agree that the intensive effort may soon turn up the monster of the lake. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians. Near Innsbruck stands a monument to perversity. Castle Ambras, occupied during the 16th century by Archduke Ferdinand, harbors one of the most terrifying portrait galleries in the civilized world. Painted from life, these grotesqueries reflect the offbeat tastes of the collector. In this gallery of the bizarre are images of those maimed in battle or deformed by nature. One portrait seems curiously out of place. It's that of a king who ruled not in Austria, but in a land to the east, now called Romania. His brutality earned him the nickname Vlad the Impaler. His real name was Vlad Dracula. Centuries later, Dracula's name and the land he lived in would be used to create a character so unredeemed by human qualities that we still recoil in fascination at his fiendish exploits.
fiction or reality. A search for the truth behind the legend. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Horror has a special fascination for many, and filmmakers have done their best to exploit that fascination. Audiences have come to know Dracula well. They've seen him portrayed on the screen for more than 50 years. There's the black cape, the jutting canine teeth, the demonic eyes and nocturnal lust for blood. But what of the truth behind the legend? Romania is a land rich in romantic folklore and legends. The tale of the evil Count Dracula is not one of them. The rugged mountains and hidden valleys breed their own mythology. Called Romania's Olympus, Mount Ceflau rises nearly 6,000 feet in the Carpathian Mountains. In pre-Christian times, it was believed to be the home of the gods. Each year, even now, on the first Sunday of August, a pagan ritual is reenacted. Thousands gather by torchlight on Cheflau's shadowy summit to celebrate friendship and love and the renewal of life. During the rest of the year, Cheflau yields its mysteries to few men. Dr. George Yakumi is a surgeon who climbs mainly for adventure. The other, a shepherd, who has spent a lifetime in these alpine meadows. Both know the mountain and its hidden places. Both respect its awesome symbolic power. Though one is a simple peasant, the other a man of science, the mountain has given them a strong bond of friendship. They exchange stories of ancient superstitions of dark, frightening corners where no one has yet ventured. The music seems to recall a distant time in these mountains when ghosts inhabited Cheflau. Legends tell of a 15th century nobleman named Boudou who loved the king's daughter, Anna. When he was killed in battle, the grief-stricken Anna asked the powerful witch to bring her lover back from the dead. The witch raised Boudou from his grave, but as a ghost. While passing over Cheflau, Boudou's ghost was struck by the rising sun, turning him into rock. Till this day, on Cheflau's brooding summit, there is a stone megalith known as Boudou's Tower. In the nightmare world of superstition and fear, it often becomes difficult to separate fact from fiction. The familiar story of Dracula is a case in point. Since its publication in 1897, Bram Stoker's classic novel of gothic horror has been read or performed almost continuously. Yet few are aware that the character was based on a real prince of darkness, whose deeds are perhaps more shocking and more terrifying than those of the fictional vampire. Transylvania, stronghold of legend. A place dimly recalled from horror movies as a dark, forbidding region cloaked in superstition and terror. Here, according to popular myth, live the undead, the dreaded vampires who thrive on human blood. Dracula, written by Bram Stoker, perpetuated one myth that has endured for nearly a century. Along Transylvania's southern perimeter stands Castle Braun. In appearance, it corresponds to the castle described in the novel 
as the home of the bloodthirsty Count. Haunted by his own childhood visions of threatening forests and spooky castles, Bram Stoker created an eerie world that became more than just a horrifying journey into the supernatural. It was also a parable of Victorian repression. Locked inside Castle Dracula's dark walls were hidden passions and secret longings, which erupted into violence and terror. The German film classic Nosferatu comes closer to capturing the mood of the original novel than the later interpretation of Bela Lugosi. In the book, the hero Jonathan Harker describes his first encounter with Dracula. Holding out his hand, he grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice. Taking Transylvania, a remote place he'd heard of but never seen, as his setting, Stoker evoked chilling images of the living dead. Under the shroud of darkness, the fiendish apparition risen from its coffin begins to stalk its human prey. The nightmare becomes reality. The unknown clutches at our throats. The shrieking of the vampire bat evokes the horror of Dracula. Night flying hunters, they prey mainly on cattle. But one strange fact stands out. The vampire bat is found only in Mexico and South America. Modern Romanians stubbornly deny the existence of vampire legends in Transylvanian peasant lore. To them, Dracula is the name of a 15th century tyrant whose story too was written in blood. Nikolai Paduraru is an official of the Ministry of Tourism. His search for the historical truths behind the Dracula legends brings him repeatedly to a small island on Lake Snagov, near the capital city of Bucharest. It is on this island that the body of the real Dracula is supposedly buried. <laughs> Nikolai knows the island's history and its few inhabitants intimately. A product of Romania's socialist present, he is fascinated by his nation's turbulent past. Nikolai is greeted by the abbot, who shares his interest in the story of the bloody king who bore the name Dracula. For the two men, the old church has become more than a religious shrine and national monument. Its ancient doors are the gateway to a mystery that for centuries has baffled scholars and historians. Superstitious romantics have speculated that any robber entering the church would be met by Dracula's ghost rising in vengeance from its grave. And this, they say, is why he lies buried just inside the door. A more logical explanation was forwarded by archaeologist Dino Rossetti, who uncovered the burial site in the early 30s. The decapitated body was placed in an unmarked grave to prevent vandalism. Saints and kings have begun to fade silently from Snagov's walls. The monastery enjoyed the protection of Vlad Dracula during the 15th century. But when one of the priests dared challenge the king's decisions, he was put to death, slowly and painfully. 
The torturous method of execution favored by the king was so barbarous, his own countrymen branded him Vlad the Impaler. In Romanian, Vlad Sepesh. Both men realize that the truth about a man's life is often buried alongside his corpse. That the infamous monarch, whose name symbolizes evil incarnate, might himself have been the victim of propaganda spread by his enemies throughout Europe. Seeking the truth can become an exciting adventure, and so a search begins. It will unravel some of the mysteries which surround the life of a king they called Dracula, son of the devil. Transylvania, the heart of Dracula country. Transylvania spreads across northwestern Romania in an unbroken chain of fertile hills and sunlit valleys. Here, the princes of Wallachia sought refuge from fierce Muslim warriors who burned their villages, raped their land, and punished captives by mercilessly driving stakes through their bodies. From the Turks, a young Wallachian prince named Dracula would learn all about impalement. Like an image from an old fairy tale, the town of Sigishora slumbers peacefully along the gentle slopes of the Transylvanian highlands. Unchanged since the Middle Ages, Sigishora was once a bastion of Germanic military might and commercial enterprise. In this house in 1431, a son was born to the fearsome prince Vlad Dracul, the dragon. The boy was called Dracula, son of the dragon. A coin bearing the family emblem is one of the few remaining artifacts from Dracula's reign. The symbol of the dragon reinforced Vlad's image as a fearless Christian crusader. As his notoriety grew, the name Dracula took on new meaning. Dragon would be increasingly interpreted as devil. Vlad belonged to an age of brutality. The Renaissance, which saw the rebirth of art and learning, also bred new tyrannies, unspeakable torture and oppression. To understand Vlad's cruelty, we must also understand his world. The nunnery at Suchevitsa was originally a fortified monastery, protected by walls 20 feet high and 10 feet thick. The traditional woodblock, summoning nuns and monks to prayer, may at one time have also been a summons to battle. For the monasteries of Romania were more than strongholds of the Christian faith. They were part of a formidable defense perimeter to ward off invaders. It's likely that the young Dracula looked out from the battlements of such a monastery watching men die in the brutal spectacle of war. Steeped in the teachings of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Vlad Dracula surely must have developed strong, simple notions of good and evil, of reward and retribution. The Ladder of Virtues, the work of an unknown artist, shows that in the climb toward heaven, few are virtuous enough to reach it. Most topple along the way, headed toward eternal damnation. To a young prince, impressionable and bristling for power, such messages were clear. By punishing evil, salvation could be had. Until the 16th century, Suceva was the capital of the province of Moldavia. Here, Vlad Dracula fled, deposed after briefly assuming the throne of Wallachia at the age of 17. 
This was the beginning of his second exile. The first time, he'd been sent as a hostage to the Turkish court by his father, a guarantee against war with the Sultan. As Vlad waited in Sucheva to take power, he vowed to free Valachia from Turkish domination and break the power of the nobles and church. In 1456, the second reign of Vlad Dracula began. The greatest threat to his power centered in the German towns of southern Transylvania. Of these, Brasov was the largest. Convinced that her powerful merchants were conspiring with his enemies, furious at the defiance of his trade restrictions, Vlad launched a series of punitive raids against Brasov and neighboring towns, taking a terrible toll of their citizens. How many perished by his command, no one can say. That slow, torturous death by impalement was excessively barbaric, no one can deny. Yet since the only written accounts from that time come from Germany, it's conceivable the atrocity reports were exaggerated. Not so the massacre at Turgovisti, Vlad's capital. During his successful campaign against the Turks, he impaled thousands of enemy soldiers outside the city gates to frighten the invaders. He would be known now for all time as Vlad the Impaler. Viewed through the filter of time, another side to Vlad's character emerges. His bold strategies won the admiration of his Turkish opponents, who also regarded him as just and honest. On the threshold of victory, he was betrayed by his younger brother, Radu, and forced into political captivity in Hungary. After 12 years, Vlad was restored to the throne by his cousin, Stephen the Great. Faces from the present. A few among the million and a half who live in Bucharest, Romania's bustling capital. In their city, Vlad the Impaler made his last stand. Not far from the center of Bucharest, with its huge outdoor markets, are archaeological remnants of its past. Layers of history, stripped away, reveal fortifications dating back to the 13th century. Below ground level, there has been unearthed a portion of the original castle built by Vlad Dracula. It was in these haunted surroundings that Dracula planned his last campaign against the Turks. His third and final reign would last only two months. On December 14, 1476, he was killed in battle near Bucharest. And according to eyewitnesses, beheaded, perhaps mistakenly, by one of his own troops. Vlad's remains were secretly buried at Snagov. In death's darkness, the prince may finally have found peace. If some light has been shed on the truth during this search for Dracula, it doesn't mean that belief in vampires will be dispelled. Bram Stoker's Dracula will always persist in our minds because in him we have found the perfect symbol for unrepentant evil. In Nosferatu, Dracula is destroyed by the daylight, dissolving in a puff of smoke. But many would prefer to feel he can still be found, lurking somewhere in the mist-shrouded mountains of Transylvania. Beneath storybook towers, the old Transylvanian city of Sigishora seems untouched by time. Her people still bear traces of their medieval ancestry, clinging tenaciously to old traditions and religious faith. They are steeped in Sigishora's history, remembering that it once was a stronghold of wealth and power, the home of princes, the birthplace of a king. Vlad Dracula belongs to their heritage, Stoker's vampire to our imaginations. Legends die slowly. 
the myth of the human being who takes the form of a bat and drinks blood will survive because people choose to believe. Vampires, like werewolves and monsters, serve a purpose. They are representations of our hidden fears. By conquering these nightmare creatures, we purge ourselves of our darkest thoughts, and in so doing, reclaim the human spirit. Nearly 40 years after Amelia Earhart's disappearance, there are surprising new theories to explore. The early morning of July 2nd, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator are bound westward over the lonely mid-Pacific. It is the final leg of a grueling round-the-world flight. Within several hours, they will disappear. Nearly 40 years after Amelia Earhart's disappearance, there are surprising new theories to explore. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In 1932, Amelia Earhart returns home triumphantly. Against incredible odds, she is the first woman to have flown the Atlantic Ocean to Ireland all alone. America is crippled by the Depression, but for this brave woman, the nation gladly musters its most lavish welcome. Her courage has captured the heart and imagination of the entire world. It's much easier to fly the Atlantic Ocean now than it was a few years ago. I expect to be able to do it in my lifetime again. Possibly not. Possibly not as a solo expedition, but in regular transatlantic service, which is inevitable in our lifetime. Her skill and courage are established, but Amelia Earhart delights in the challenge of new accomplishment. She sets an altitude record in an autogyro. Soon she's aloft again to capture a new women's transcontinental speed record. I wanted to carry on the trip. You mean to eat? Yeah, to eat and drink. Well, I carried some water, of course, because my cockpit is very warm. And I carried a sandwich in case. I didn't eat it, though. I carried some hot chocolate and um, the old reliable tomato juice. What kind of a sandwich was it? <laughs> Chicken sandwich. <laughs> in 1935, she sails for Hawaii on an announced pleasure trip with her husband, publisher George Putnam. She once told him, I fly better than I wash dishes. The public wonders why she has taken her plane along. Amelia Earhart put speculation to an end when she flew home, becoming the first to solo from Hawaii to California. Even now, she's thinking of another great adventure. Soon, she announces her plans for a flight around the world. 
contemplated course covers about 27,000 miles. Uh, it will be the first flight, if successful, which approximates the equator. The plane I'm using on the proposed flight is a transport plane. It is for Lockheed Electra, uh, normally carrying 10 passengers and two pilots. This airplane will take Amelia on her most challenging and hazardous flight. Several days before departure, she tells her husband and the public just why she will do it. Well, GP, you know it's because I want to. <laughs> to a husband, that has a fairly familiar sound. But aside from that, you expect to accomplish something for aviation, do you not? Well, yes, I do. And if the flight's successful, I hope it will increase women's interest in flying. If so, it will be worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. Well, how about taking me along? Well, of course, I think a great deal of you, but 180 pounds of gasoline on a flight perhaps might be a little more valuable. You mean you prefer 180 pounds of gasoline to 180 pounds of husband? I think you guessed right. A rainy June morning, 1937. The final preparations are made. In the next 40 days, Amelia and her expert navigator, Fred Noonan, will fly three quarters of the way around the world. final leg of the flight, with little more than 7,000 miles to go, she will vanish over the mid-Pacific without a trace. The news that Amelia Earhart was lost registered shock and disbelief throughout the world. She'd come within days of achieving her goal, and for many it was difficult to accept that so courageous a woman could be gone so suddenly. Almost immediately after her disappearance, the public imagination became fired with rumors and speculation that Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, might be alive and well on an uncharted Pacific reef, that she may have been shot down by Japanese fighter planes and then captured, that perhaps she was actually on a top secret spy mission for our government. <laughs> Five years after her disappearance, a Hollywood film starring Rosalind Russell does much to keep rumors about Amelia Earhart alive. Miss Carter, we want you to do a job for us. A big job. So big that I have no hesitation in saying that the safety of our country may very well depend upon a successful outcome. Are you sure you want me? It's a job that can be only carried off by a woman who happens to be a world-renowned flyer and uh, whose personality has caught on with the world. You land on that little speck right there, Gull Island. The top secret mission calls for the lady flyer to deliberately ditch near a small Pacific island where food and provisions have been stored. But as far as the world knows, you're lost. There'll be a widespread search for you. Public opinion will demand it. That search will include the Japanese mandated islands. And Japan won't dare to interfere because we are looking for you, the world's greatest woman flyer. During that search, we'll photograph every square mile of those islands. Then, when war comes, we'll be able to defend ourselves against attack and strike back at the nerve centers of their empire. flying career has probably ended. Tony Carter is definitely lost. There's been no report for hours. Her second attempt to overcome the hazards of a world flight has ended in disaster. Tony Carter lost somewhere in the South Pacific. When she learns the Japanese know of the plan, she ditches where no one can find her. Questions about Amelia Earhart persist. 
Yet retired Air Force Major Joseph Jervis has devoted nearly 20 years of research to what he believes is the answer. The last flight was really a military flight. Two civilian people flying a civilian aircraft on a mission for the then President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. The purpose of the flight was to overfly the truck atoll in the Pacific where the Japanese were secretly fortifying, to take pictures of it, and to return back to the United States with photographic evidence to present to the League of Nations that Japan was in violation of the treaty. The Japanese, with an aircraft carrier stationed between Canton Island and Hull, and with Japanese Zero intercepted Earhart and shot her down, and she made a crash landing on the island of Hull. Major Jervis's belief that Amelia Earhart landed on Hull Island is based largely on his interpretation of civilian radio direction reports received during the Earhart flight. He also finds a photograph of Hull Island, which he believes shows a Japanese flag near the wreckage of Amelia Earhart's aircraft. From a former Japanese soldier, Ramon Cabrera, Jervis learns that in 1937, a woman pilot was interrogated by this Japanese officer and then taken captive to Japan. In Japan, she was a very important political prisoner. She was held captive in the Imperial Palace for a period of uh, approximately eight years. At the uh, close of World War II, uh, two weeks before MacArthur occupied Japan, Jacqueline Cochran and a group of people went in there and secretly uh, removed Amelia Earhart out of Japan before the occupation, disguised as a nun. Uh, they brought her to this country. She took on a new identity, a uh, new occupation, has spent time living in uh, Jamesburg, New Jersey, at a place called Leisure World, and also has spent time abroad being involved in foreign radio broadcasts, particularly in the area of Luxembourg. I have been studying Amelia Earhart for 17 years. I have over a thousand photographs of her from the time she was a baby uh, through her time in elementary and high school and all the other things that she did. I know more about her than I know about my mother. Well, Amelia Earhart, I believe, has taken on an identity of, of the name of uh, Irene Bolam. In 1965, Jervis meets this couple while delivering a lecture. He becomes convinced that this woman's true identity holds the proof to his theory. And I went over and I met this couple and I looked this lady straight in the face and I knew who it was as soon as I looked at her. Amelia Earhart. I would know her anywhere in the world. It's a fantastic story which makes me out to be some kind of a mystery woman. It is utter nonsense. I think she's Amelia Earhart because this entire episode, you know, is shrouded with mystery. I am not a mystery woman. I am not Amelia Earhart. I don't know what the ending to all this, you know, will be, but I would like it to have, you know, a happy ending. Really. I really would. If there was anything bad about it, I don't think I'd want to be associated with it. Really. Because I have that much admiration and respect for her. And I think she's really a lovely person. Really. And I like her very much. Jervis is not alone in his search, and others have come up with different answers. The determined search for a solution to the Amelia Earhart mystery has followed many intriguing routes. Two independent investigators now believe that the final answer is very close at hand. The Pacific leg of Earhart's last flight is by far the longest and most dangerous. Her first destination is a refueling stop at Howland Island. A tiny two square mile atoll in the mid-Pacific, it juts only 15 feet above the sea. The Coast Guard cutter Itasca stands off Howland to provide Earhart with radio assistance. On the morning of July 2nd, Earhart radios that she is low on fuel in the vicinity of Howland, but cannot find the island. A world record holding pilot and navigator, Captain Elgin Long has carefully studied a wealth of detailed information about Amelia Earhart's last flight. He has analyzed such things as the fuel consumption of Earhart's plane, the strength of radio signals received by the cutter Itasca, and the effect on the flight of crosswinds, which Earhart did not even know were there. With this data, Captain Long has reconstructed a sophisticated navigational model 
of Amelia Earhart's final flight. Actually, I think everything went smooth in the flight. All indications are up until they reported over Howland Island at 742. At that time, they said, we should be on you, but we cannot see you. In other words, they thought they were at Howland. They didn't know anything was wrong up until then. Now, I can't find the evidence doesn't indicate any single mistake that anyone made that caused them to miss the island, which they obviously did. Rather, it's a series of small errors that compounded themselves, and unfortunately, all in the same direction, which caused it all to happen, and indeed, they did miss the island. And of course, once they couldn't find the island, they searched for it for over an hour and ran out of fuel, and their fuel was exhausted, and then were forced to ditch the airplane into the sea. In the movie, Flight for Freedom, the end was depicted this way. From the information he has gathered, Captain Long believes that he has pinpointed the exact place where Amelia Earhart crashed into the sea. The location is about 40 miles northwest of Howland Island, an area where the water is over 16,000 feet deep. Actually, the airplane's almost perfectly preserved. You know, this is something we weren't familiar with. Uh, just a few years ago, of course, uh, we didn't know anything about the deep abyss. But now, we know that things are preserved in deep water. And we have recovered airplanes that have been underwater for almost 30 years. And as long as they were in deep water, everything in that airplane and the airplane itself is, it would scare you to death. It's just like the day it went down there. The Navy uh, recovered an airplane off the coast of San Diego. They show that the airplane is almost in perfect condition. It would, it's very surprising to learn this, because we're used to things that come from shallow water. We're used to things recovered off the coast of Florida in 200 feet of water, covered with barnacles, covered with coral, rusted out. It's not that way in deep water. Captain Long believes that advanced deep sea exploration equipment like this could be used to locate and then recover the Earhart plane. The airplane sitting there today, right now, this moment, just like it went down 39 years ago. And I know that now, in order to really put it all finally to rest, that we've got to get an expedition together. We've got to get out and search and locate our airplane and recover it. And then I think finally that will put the Amelia Earhart mystery once and for all. The Amelia Earhart search will reach its conclusion. When Amelia Earhart is lost, a frantic search for her begins immediately. It is the largest naval sea hunt of its kind in history. 63 planes scout the Pacific. The coordinated search also includes more than a dozen surface vessels. In three weeks, 250,000 square miles of ocean are carefully scanned. There is no sign of Amelia Earhart. We believe the Navy missed Earhart in the search in 1937, perhaps by only a few miles. Radio messages were received after the disappearance by amateur radio operators along the west coast of the United States, and they were also received by Navy radio stations. If we'd looked in the right area in 1937, Amelia might be with us today. Newsman Fred Gurner has spent more than 16 years investigating the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. His belief that she survived her crash into the Pacific is based on his analysis of information in civilian and military radio reports. These reports were painstakingly uncovered by Gurner during several research trips to Washington. Gurner's persistent detective work, however, did not begin in Washington, D.C. Began in 1960 with CBS. I was a correspondent here in San Francisco. And we received information that there was a possibility that Amelia Earhart might have reached Saipan in the Western Marianas. And I was sent by CBS News to Saipan to find out if there was supporting information. Saipan Island is nearly 1,500 miles northwest of Earhart's destination at Howland Island. Yet Jesus Salas, 
a Saipanese farmer, recalls an incident in the Garapan prison on Saipan. In 1937, while a prisoner of the occupying Japanese army, Sala sees a white woman in the cell next to him. She is held there for several hours. Prison guards tell Salas that she is a captured American pilot. Salas never sees her again. Jose Pangelin, a grocer on Saipan, remembers seeing a white woman on the second floor of a compound hotel several times. He hears that she is a captured pilot and spy. These native Saipanese, Joaquin Seaman and Ben Salas, tell Gurner of hearing that an American woman was buried in this cemetery sometime in 1937. Gurner excavates several grave sites, but finds no proof. The strongest evidence to me is the eyewitness reports on the island of Saipan. To me, it is inconceivable that these people were not telling the truth, and it is inconceivable to me that anyone else answering those descriptions was on that island at that time. Later, Gurner finds Japanese newspaper articles from the time of Earhart's disappearance. One reports that Amelia Earhart was picked up by a Japanese fishing boat. Gurner also learns of secret government documents which he believes can prove the Japanese capture of Amelia Earhart. It is my belief that Amelia landed on a small reef area between Howland Island and Canton in the Northern Phoenix Group was picked up after our search by the Japanese taken to Saipan. She died in Japanese custody. And the proof of her Japanese custody is contained in records of the counterintelligence corps captured from the Japanese at the end of World War II. Those records are today classified in Washington. They are records, supposedly, of a Japanese interrogation of Earhart. And I think that a final answer to the mystery is going to be written. Alas, Amelia Earhart is not alive and well and living in New Jersey. I wish that she were. In at least some sense, Amelia Earhart is alive. For in the memory of her courage, her passion, her dedication to an ideal, she still touches many of us. It has been nearly 40 years since Amelia Earhart vanished and the final answer to her disappearance is still an enigma. There's a vast amount of convincing, yet sometimes contradictory evidence, which can support any one of several explanations. But who is right? For at least three men, the search for the answer will continue. It will go on until someone proves without the slightest doubt the final fate of this daring and charismatic woman. Before the takeoff on her last flight, Amelia wrote to her husband, please know that I am quite aware of the hazards. I want to do it because I want to do it. Women must try to do things as men have tried. When they fail, their failure must be but a challenge to others. forces obliterate German cities, Nazi party functionaries scramble for cover, carrying with them far more than their own worldly goods. From D-Day the 6th of June to the complete collapse of German military strength, a brief eight months had gone by. There had been little time for the looters to hide their ill-gotten wealth. 
By war's end, hundreds of millions of dollars in jewels, gold, and artworks were being stuffed into strong boxes to be hidden in the most unlikely places. The plunder set off one of the greatest treasure hunts in history. Some of the treasures were buried in an Austrian salt mine during World War II. Some were recovered. Many remain unfound to this day. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. From the east, Russian forces hammered Berlin in the last days of World War II. In the spring of 1945, Adolf Hitler ordered the German army to defend Berlin to the death of the last man. Russian soldiers sealed off Berlin as American troops mopped up the scattered pockets of German resistance east of the Rhine River. In the closing days of the war, every foot of land was paid for with a life. Once haughty German legions defended Hitler's capital city with companies made up of old men and young boys. Russian infantrymen poured into the marble halls of the capital and sounded the death knoll of the so-called Thousand Year Reich. Even as the Allied armies were writing an end to the Third Reich in Berlin, Hitler's henchmen were scurrying to save themselves. Men like Martin Bormann, the architects of Nazi power for a dozen years weren't about to surrender or commit suicide as their leader had done. They had access to the plunder of Europe, gold bullion worth hundreds of millions of dollars and priceless works of painting and sculpture. They snatched what they could and ran for their lives, some to be caught later, others never to be seen again. Their disappearance touched off the greatest manhunt in history and the greatest search for treasure. As Berlin fell, more than 500 top-ranking Nazis disappeared from sight. They took to the roads, wearing civilian clothes and using any means of transportation they could beg, borrow, or steal. The stolen treasures they carried were to be passports to a new life. The departure from Berlin of Nazi leaders was a far cry from their triumphant marches through conquered cities just six years earlier. On a spring day in 1940, the streets of Paris played host to a strange caravan. Riding in an open staff car, selected officers accompanied Adolf Hitler on a tour of the City of Light. In less than eight hours, Adolf Hitler would leave Paris never to return. Himself a frustrated artist, he would order his troops to confiscate the great art treasures of private and public collections and bring them back to the Third Reich. Art historians have often attempted to trace the plundering that occurred during the Nazi occupation of Western Europe, but an impossible jungle of documents has subverted most of their attempts. 
Like children playing with newfound toys, Hitler and Goring examined each new collection that was brought to Germany. Countless hundreds of millions of dollars in paintings and sculpture adorned the walls of the Nazi Museum in Munich. Still other great treasures were hidden in a 15th century castle called New Schwanstein. The castle was the creation of Ludwig II, the Mad King of Bavaria. In a sense, one madman's monument had become a storehouse for the greed and fantasies of another. For a time, Ludwig's collection of cheap glass and plaster fixtures was dignified by some of the finest works of Europe's old masters. As World War II ended, American GIs were sent to the castle to recover its treasures. What they found were the works of incomparable artists haphazardly grouped with paintings of little or no merit. A salt mine had been the Nazi treasure repository. In the perfectly controlled humidifier, an elaborate vault had been created in which the paintings could be safely housed. To this day, the salt mine remains. It is possible to enter each of the wood-clad rooms and conjure up images of rack upon rack filled with priceless art. The search for treasure taken from the salt mine was assigned to men like Walter Horn, a German-born art historian who worked with U.S. military intelligence after the war. I was assigned to an intelligence unit which was in charge of the recovery of treasures, art treasures that had been displaced or stolen. There were two very interesting cases. One of them was the recovery of the crown jewels of the Holy Roman Empire, five of the most important pieces of which had disappeared. The other one, psychologically perhaps more interesting because the key figure in that story was a woman, was uh, the uh, disappearance of two million dollars worth of gold coins from the salt mines of Altausi. The only thing that was known about them was that they were last in the hands of an SS major called von Hummel, who was the right-hand man of Martin Bormann, who was the right-hand man of Adolf Hitler. The problem was to find a man who had disappeared six months earlier. Disappeared from a Berlin under fire. Martin Bormann left the bunker where Hitler was to die and made a frantic race for freedom. Years later, his chauffeur retraced the escape route used by Bormann and his men. As Russian tanks bombarded the area around the Reichstag, they made their way across the Spree River. In the very center of the city, they took refuge in an underground train station. In the subway tunnel, wearing civilian clothes, they mingled with frightened Berliners, praying that their meager concrete roof would stand up under the bombardment. Once they reached the western edge of the city, they took temporary refuge in a broken ruin, hoping to last out the day. I went onto the normal 
using the normal methods of searching for a man by trying to meet the people who saw him last and see whether his tracks disappeared or did not disappear, they disappeared. Apparently, the escapees weathered that night in an abandoned building and the next day set out on a prearranged escape route south. Bormann's face was well known to almost every German. In the chaos surrounding war's end, however, he slipped out of Berlin and made his way to the Alps. After about two weeks in the Austrian mountains, including a search in the Alpine huts and a search in sawmills all the way down from the high Alps to the valley of Salzburg, I had come to the conclusion that he was lost. Were it not for the dedication of the hunter, the treasure might have been forever lost. That I had no other choice now than to approach Mrs. von Hummel. At the end of a conversation, rather than interrogation of about 45 minutes, she admitted that she knew where he was and declared her willingness to go and see him and to inquire about the whereabouts of the coins. I left her alone for three days, saw her again, and she declared, Lieutenant Horn, I'm happy to report that the coins are in the hands of the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg. I said, this is fine, Mrs. von Hummel, my mission is accomplished. Other pieces of treasure, however, were not found, and years later would become the subject of life and death struggles. Trainloads of priceless treasure rolled across the German countryside. Hitler's officers made sure the plunder of Europe was complete. It included the most precious thing of all, humanity. Hundreds of thousands of Jews would be herded aboard Hitler's trains. Many would die of starvation along the way. The trains leaving collection centers throughout Europe were expressions of fundamental Nazi philosophy. To be other than German was to be inferior. To be Jewish was to be despised. At the end of the line were the concentration camps. They were foul stockyards of humanity stripped of hope. With the Jews, Hitler found the scapegoat he needed to explain Germany's failures between the wars. The Nazis were stealing lives now, and they weren't above making a profit at it. Grisly crimes were committed by the Nazis in their dozen-year reign of terror in Europe. Worst of these were the assaults on human dignity, typified by the robbing of gold from the mouths of murdered Jews. Another atrocity was the collection of huge sums in gold and diamonds from concentration camp inmates who thought they could buy back their lives. They couldn't, but they made their killers rich trying. The horror of it struck home when the Allies took over the camps. They entered as liberators, but there were no cheering crowds. They beheld instead a tragic spectacle. Combat hadn't prepared them for this. The ovens, Hitler's final solution. Human bones piled everywhere. Clearly, the horrors invented by the Nazis were beyond comprehension, beyond words. Treasure could be recovered, but lives could not. The task would be enormous. Perhaps it would never be completed. The great bulk of Nazi plunder would be recovered immediately after the war. Uncounted millions, however, disappeared with Hitler's henchmen. Men who, like Martin Bormann, are still at large. Among them, Dr. Joseph Mengele. He conducted unspeakable research on the inmates of concentration camps. Inmates would have sooner faced the ovens than Mengele's knife. At Nuremberg, the Allies tried top Nazi leaders captured at war's end. But the colonels and majors of the Third Reich carried their treasures with them into peacetime Europe. Austria's Lake Toplitze, gold bars and hundreds of thousands of counterfeit English pounds were recovered from the lake in 1957. What better place for hiding treasure quickly than a deep alpine lake? How much remains to be discovered? Two men have disappeared trying to answer that question.
The search goes on in spite of the lake's ominous history. The Austrian government tries to discourage treasure hunters, but the lure of Nazi gold is powerful. Two volunteer firemen from a nearby city have dreamed of the riches that may lie beneath the lake. The dream brings them to Toplice again and again. Perhaps this will be the day. The quest is exhilarating, but not without danger. Vigilance is important. Yeah. Treasure hunters are optimists, and it is a fine day for a dive. Optimists, yes. But the treasure hunters know other hunters may be abroad. The men who hid the gold were not strangers to killing. Who knows where they are now? The water is deep and cold. It is easy to see how it has kept its secret for more than 30 years. The divers are spurred by the knowledge that the quest paid off once. There was another time when blood may have been spilled to keep the secret of the lake. The secret was born in 1945. The Nazi hierarchy, not killed outright, was in flight. If they were caught, they might lie their way out of long prison sentences, but not if they were caught with treasure. Fortunes must have been hidden in haste. Lakes along the escape route beckoned. Almost 20 years later, some of the treasure has already been found. Perhaps someone was there to make sure no more would be. Did the divers find something? Something that cost them their lives? We only know that they vanished. Some think the underground Nazi movement called Odessa was involved. It is 1976. No one will vanish on this dive. There will be no treasure either. It is possible that the gold remaining in Toplice was moved years ago when its guardians felt others closing in. There are many other lakes and many secret bank accounts. Serious investigators don't dismiss the notion that there are still men in hiding who would see Hitler's nightmare world reborn. Great treasure would have to be close at hand to once again unleash the dogs of war. That prospect alone may be enough to drive men to continue the search for Nazi plunder. Florence. The capital of Renaissance culture is the center for the continuing search for the plundered art treasures of Europe. Rudolfo Siviero is the most active of the art detectives. He stayed on the trail of Nazi art thieves long after others had given up. Siviero has searched thousands of German documents for clues. With them, he has recovered dozens of stolen masterpieces. Manifests, bills of lading, army memos, reminders of past outrages. The collections of the Uffizi Gallery and the Pitti Palace in Florence have been reconstructed through the work of Severo and his colleagues. Yet Severo estimates that a third of Italy's plundered art is still missing. He thinks much of it is hidden behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany. 
One of his hardest tasks has been to root out the fake masterpieces that began showing up after the war. Museums, anxious to restore their collections, often fell victim to swindles. The flood of copies has made it even harder to trace the fate of the originals. Siviero remains dedicated to restoring his nation's art heritage, no matter how difficult the task. It is important for men like Siviero to believe that beauty can endure. It must endure if man is to banish the ugliness of war. Perhaps if beauty endures, the flaming destruction of the past can finally be cast aside. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world, seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians. They've been reported at dusk or in the dead of night, in clearings amid still woods and fields in lonely farm country. Sometimes they come in silence, sometimes with quiet thunder. Often they leave marks in the earth, signals of their passing. They've been seen but fleetingly, and their extraordinary presence creates a frightening mystery. In fields from West Virginia through Wisconsin to Oregon are the beginnings of answers. of ground on a football field. Normal people saw the object that made it. It begins tonight's search for answers. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. On June 24, 1947, an Idaho businessman named Kenneth Arnold was flying his private plane near Washington's Mount Rainier. He saw nine disc-like objects moving rapidly along the horizon. Arnold said they moved erratically, like saucers skipped across a pond. Flying saucer thus became part of our language. After the Mount Rainier sighting, unidentified flying objects were reported all over the country, an astonishing number of them and the sightings have continued to this day. A chill morning in Mellon, Wisconsin. Quiet fields and quiet people. 
Yet something remarkable happened on the Mellontown Road. Something that would have seemed incredible if it hadn't happened to people as down to earth as the town of Mellon itself. Philip Baker works in a mill on the same job for more than 20 years. He's grown up here and passed on to his children a love for the land, a love for planting and harvesting his own crops, for cutting wood to warm the house in the long Wisconsin winters. He was an officer in his union once, but stepped down because it meant too much time away from his wife, Shirley, and their kids, Monty, Jeff, Jane, and John. The most important things to the Baker family are hard work and being together. They were together the most incredible night of their lives. It was March 13, 1975. I was carrying two cats. I was walking to the garage. And I got by this corner, right by the house here. And I looked, and there was this weird object, funny noises, and it was really bright. And I didn't know what I should do. So I was going back and forth, and finally I threw the cat in the garage. And then I ran to the house around the corner, and I couldn't get the door open. When I first saw it, I was standing approximately right here. But I couldn't get too good of a view of it because the brush and the trees were in the way. So then I, um, I went back into the house, and I got my coat on. My uh, two youngest boys and Jane were following me. We went over here get a better look at the object that was sitting on the road and my curiosity still wanted me to get a better view of it so we walked down of course the ground was covered with snow and my car was sitting here in the driveway and and of course there were snow banks on the side of the roads and there's where i got my estimate of the size of the object approximately 12 feet in diameter, but also with the markings on, in the snow. Uh, and I would judge the, the object at the center of it was approximately six feet high. It was uh, like a turtle. My two boys and my girl started to proceed here closer. My girl told me not to go any closer to it. Yeah, she ran back in the house. And he was going to go walking up to it, and I went back to the house and told my mom that he was going to go up there and get closer to it. And she came out and she yelled at him. Uh, my wife came out and hollered at me and told me uh, not to be foolish and go any closer to it, not knowing exactly what the object was uh, on the road. And, of course, I did get a very good view of it from here, as there was no, nothing blocking my vision on the, on the road. Montgomery uh, was looking out the upstairs windows where he got his view uh, of the object. And we went in the house and we called the deputy sheriff. And when the deputy um, said hello, it was a boom and it was gone. I went out and I couldn't see it anymore. The sheriff came and he saw nothing. That can be a pretty lonely feeling to have witnessed something incredible and be unable to produce evidence. Loneliest of all, perhaps, for the Baker children. They would want to tell their story to friends at school. But who would believe them? Oh, well, Monty, my oldest boy, he was all upset. He says, told uh, my other two boys, now, don't say anything. Don't say anything to kids at school. We don't want nothing of this to get out. And, of course, Janie was in tears. She says, well, I know what I saw. She says, uh, you, you trying to tell me I'm, I'm crazy or something? She says, I know what we saw. She says, don't try to tell me I, I didn't see anything, because she said, I know I saw it. And she was in tears and everything else that night. And, uh, of course, the undersheriff, I apologized when he left me off here, because I thought, well, now we didn't find anything. He said, he'll think I'm, I'm a little off, too. And he said, no, no, don't forget, just forget about it. And I said, well, let's, I said, okay, let's forget about it. And I said, but don't tell anybody then. I, I, matter of fact, I even mentioned him. I said, don't tell anybody. I said, just, just forget it then. Because I said, I didn't, let's drop the whole story. Mellon has a newspaper, the Weekly Record. Editor Jasper Landry knows just about everybody in Mellon by first name. I've known Mr. Baker for about 30 years. And uh, 
he and his family are, have been here a long time. And when this story broke on the UFOs, uh, he asked me not to put it in the paper because of the anxiety his family was being put through by callers and uh, uh, curiosity seekers. And uh, so I thought that I wouldn't. And uh, he was very appreciative. Uh, I honored his wish to not have it printed. The story got around anyway of this country lane where the Baker family saw something big and metallic with red and green lights, something that was gone almost as soon as it came. I am George Ree, Mellon, Wisconsin. I am the undersheriff of Ashland County. On this night in question, I answered a complaint of Philip Baker, and I arrived at the site, and I investigated it, and I firmly believed that the Baker family did see a, an object. Sheriff Ree had good reason to believe Baker's story. He may have arrived at the Baker house too late to see anything there. But when he left, a second call came to investigate reported lights in the sky. Ree and seven deputies from two counties raced across country roads. Sheriff Ree would sight a bright object darting in the sky, call on his radio for another car to intercept it, and the object would dart away, sometimes to briefly join another hovering in the sky. One of Ree's deputies said the light given off by the objects was so intense he could read a newspaper by it. And when it passed over another patrol car, the police radio went dead. To this moment, no one knows what it was that George Ree and seven county policemen chased that night in Wisconsin. Big Chimney, West Virginia. It has been suggested that the overwhelming percentage of UFO sightings occur in small towns and rural farmlands for good reasons. The view is less obstructed, for one thing. The residents are more likely to be looking up at the sky, more sensitive to the changing lights above. It's about 9.30 in the night. We were driving north on 119 towards Clinton, and my wife saw some intensely bright lights in the sky. And she commented that this was the brightest airplane lights that she'd ever seen. I looked up and there this big diamond-shaped object with big flat ends set right above the treetops. Carol Critchfield pursued his UFO to the spot where he saw it set down and found marks that could have been made by landing gear. Critchfield is a foreman in a big chimney chemical plant. He's not the sort of man who is often called on to take lie detector tests. But he knows how incredible his story must sound. I'm Ian Criswell from the Criswell Security Agency in Wheeling, West Virginia. Myself and a team of investigative specialists conducted extensive polygraph testing of Mr. Critchfield. The lie detector, or polygraph, is a sensitive device for recording changes in body temperature, rate of breathing, electrical impulses in the skin, and heartbeat. Preliminary tests established normal parameters, which, if exceeded during the actual test, indicate deception. Yeah, this is the blood pressure pattern, this is a skin sensitivity pattern, and this is a breathing pattern. A lie detector test cannot prove whether or not Critchfield saw a UFO. It can only indicate whether he believes he is telling the truth. Is your last name Critchfield? Yes. Do you intend to answer all of my questions truthfully? Yes. Are you being completely truthful to the best of your belief concerning the object which you described and saw in the written statement describing the events of June 12, 1975? Yes. Were you being truthful when you say that in the first 35 years of your life you have never lied to a police officer? Yes. 
Are you being completely truthful when you say that you have no knowledge of how the burn spots and other evidence were created other than by the object described in your written statement? Yes. The test is now over. On the first question here concerning Mr. Critchfield's name, there was no reaction in any of the tracings. And the second question concerning the, uh, does he plan to answer all questions truthfully? Again, there were no reactions indicating deception. And question number three concerning the object that Mr. Critchfield uh, described in a written statement previous to this examination, there were no uh, reactions uh, significant of deception. And the question concerning the burn spots and the other evidence left by the object, uh, there were no reactions indicative of deception. And it is our opinion that Mr. Critchfield has told the complete truth about all statements concerning the object he cited on June 12, 1975. It would be unusual indeed if a man not noted for vivid imagination and guile could invent a story about a UFO and then control half a dozen involuntary body functions in such a way as to fool a sophisticated machine and experienced technicians. Much easier to believe that something extraordinary happened on a hilltop in Big Chimney, West Virginia, something that touched Carol Critchfield's life and left him wondering. The uh, park of transit also can be used... To get Some men, like Ted Phillips, are dedicated to finding answers for the growing number of perplexed people who have had UFO experiences. Phillips is an amateur scientist and UFO investigator. Neat little pocket penetrometer. Phillips has taken soil samples at dozens of reported UFO landing sites. He and his fellow investigators have amassed reports of no less than 60,000 UFO sightings in the past 30 years. Many of these were fairly easy to explain. Conventional aircraft, weather balloons, flocks of geese. But more than 900 cases remain unexplained. Phillips has an important ally in his search, the University of Kansas Aerospace Science Laboratory. It is the place he sends soil samples for analysis. Dr. Edward Zeller is the man in charge. Zeller believes it would be unscientific to ignore UFO reports and that the techniques of hard scientific analysis can be put to work finding answers. Medford, Minnesota. Medford provided Dr. Zeller with a test sample and a remarkable story told by Janet Kay provides the background. On the night of November 2nd, 1975, I was sitting here doing my homework and I looked out the window and right above the blue building, I saw a UFO come down out of the sky and um, it landed behind the building and behind the building is a football field, it landed there there were two other witnesses, Janet's mother, Helen, and her brother, Jerry. A lot of people in town saw it. I, I don't know how many people saw it and told us the next day that they saw this thing up in the sky. In the sky. As we pulled around the driveway here, I noticed up by the blue shed over there that there was uh, something in the sky. So I pulled out of the driveway. And I said, turn down here. We can maybe get closer to it. So we just went over this way. And then you could just see it real good before the trees. It was definitely right there. And we just drove up here, and by that stop sign, the other railroad tracks, there's a fence across, so we couldn't go any further. And we just noticed it. It was just coming right in front of the trees, and we just stood here a minute till we saw it just glide over the top of the trees, and then it was gone. Well, a couple days later, after we saw the UFO go down, 
I saw a lot of people over here looking at something, so I came over here and I found this big brown spot on the, on the football field where the grass had been burnt. As you can see, the blue building is right over there and the burn spot is right here. And it's right in line with the window we saw the UFO come down from. Now, this happens to be the sample from the Medford site, number two, which does show some strange luminescence properties. And so I'd want to make sure that the sample that I'm dealing with is not in itself radioactive. And I don't find that it is. I don't see any evidence of increased radioactivity. Yeah, at the time, it wasn't scary. It, it didn't frighten me when I looked out the window and I saw it. I, I didn't get scared or anything. But afterwards, when I realized that what I had seen was unexplainable. That's when it started to get scary. And then when they found the patch on the football field, well, that got a little, got a little worse. Furnace ready to be inserted here into the light chamber. And now we've inserted the sample, which is on the electric furnace, into the chamber. And we're going to start heating it. It's been six months since we saw the UFO go down. And as you can see, the bird spot is still visible. I, I wish I, I just wish I knew what it was. When, don't you think so? Yeah, I, I mean, if it was something, you know, from another country or something the army was putting up in the air, I wish they'd come and tell us that, I do too. that this was it and not just leave us out here thinking that it was something from some outer space place. I'd be satisfied with any kind of a explanation. Well, we're going to start off uh, here by looking then at the glow curves, which I ran about uh, two months ago on the Medford site. And if we look at the curve at the center of the site, we see that there's just a very small rise here. That is, the luminescence peak is very small. At the edge of the site, as we proceed along here, at the edge of the site, we discover the intense luminescence. Now, this luminescence that we are observing is apparently the result of some sort of radiation effect. It looks, at least, as though that particular uh, sample at the edge of the site has been subjected to some kind of high-energy radiation. If I had never seen a UFO, I, I wouldn't believe in it. I wouldn't believe, I wouldn't believe me if I were you. Because I, I, I have nothing to show you. I can't say, you know, I saw this. I just have nothing. All you have is my word. But there is more than just Mrs. K's word. In a recent Gallup poll, 15 million Americans claim to have seen a UFO. 15 million. The same poll showed that 51% of the adult population is convinced that flying saucers are real. For those who haven't seen one, this is a recreation of what Carol Critchfield saw on a hilltop in Big Chimney, West Virginia. The artist used the same technique that a police artist would use in recreating the features of a suspect from the descriptions of witnesses. And this is what Philip Baker saw on the town road in Mellon, Wisconsin. Helen Kay and her children saw this object land on a football field in Medford, Minnesota. The last systematic attempt by the U.S. government to investigate UFOs was conducted by the Air Force and was called Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book ended in 1968. The Air Force had by then investigated more than 11,000 UFO sightings and found explanations for all but 676. The Air Force seemed to have no interest in the sightings it could not readily attribute to earthly phenomena. Perhaps it's time to approach the question of UFOs again, without bias. For we can only hope that if we are being studied by aliens, it is with more thoroughness and care than we have focused on them. <laughs>